Good morning and good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for tuning in to today's webinar. Uh, first things first, a bit of housekeeping from our side. You will notice that you are muted for the duration of today's webinar. However, if you have any questions at any point, please do feel free to log these in the, the little question box on the GoToWebinar pop-up, and I'll be more than happy to tackle these at the end of today's session. You will also be sent a link to view the recording afterwards, so please no panicking if you miss even the tiniest shred of information today. As a matter of course, please do feel free to bombard me with any and all questions you can think of during the course of the webinar by typing them in the questions box on the GoToWebinar panel, as I say, and when we get to the end of the session, I will endeavor to answer all of these. Fantastic. Well, my name is Chris Unwin. I am a Redgate employee of just over three and a half years. Heaven knows how they put up with me. Uh, I'm the data privacy specialist here, an article writer, and the infamous co-host of the Redgate uh, DBAL podcast. Uh, so I'm going to be taking you through today's topic. So where is the best place to start? I guess probably the thing that's brought us on to talking about why compliance should form part of our strategy when it comes to protecting information in development, testing and other pre-production environments. Most recently, data breaches have been on everyone's lips and actually it's these data breaches that seem to come from all areas of the business which is making us then sit up and take notice of how we should be protecting information so many data breaches have been drawing the public eye uh, not least of these was a rubric most recently that was actually in uh, january and they're an it security and cloud management company who suffered a database breach so the database itself uh, running on a hosted amazon elastic search server was storing tens of gigabytes of data including customer names, contact information, casework for corporate customers, dating all the way back to October 2018. So Rubrik stated that whilst building a new solution for customer support, a sandbox environment containing a subset of our customer corporate contact information and support interaction data was potentially accessible for a brief period of time. So Rubrik have resolved this issue and they believe that no one did in fact access that whilst it was available. But the point remains, when we're creating uh, environments outside of production, they need to have the necessary protection to ensure that we're not making this publicly available. We can take solace from the fact that no one accessed it, but many companies, including the National Bank of India, Marriott and others, have felt the pain of exposing customer details and people taking advantage of that fact. So where are these data breaches coming from? How are they still happening? Well, it's pretty clear that regardless of which industry or sector you're in, they're going to come from somewhere. And there are so many sources that a breach can come from. As we just discussed, financial institutions, such as the Bank of India, who did also suffer a breach, they are constantly being hammered from all sides, uh, as the data that can potentially result from a breach can pay hackers in dividends. Really, if attacks can come from anywhere at any time, there's really only one approach we can take and governments and organizations around the world will be keeping a watchful eye on this as the privacy landscape of the world rapidly changes and 2019 storms ahead into 2020, 2021 and so on. So we can all agree we should be protecting our customer data for the good of those who place their trust in us. But privacy regulations around the world, such as HIPAA, SOX, GDPR, the California Consumer Privacy Act, the New York Shield, etc., demand effective and repeatable processes for protecting sensitive data. Now, what actually is 
an effective and repeatable process. Is there a lot of grey area that we somehow need to interpret and implement as part of our uh, design, as part of our environment design? Well, there is one way that we can address this, and that is, of course, adopting the principle of data protection by design and by default. Now, this is a, a quote specifically taken from the General Data Protection Regulation here in Europe, or the GDPR to some, but many, many new data privacy legislations, such as the California Consumer Privacy Act and others, are kind of adopting this best as best practice from the GDPR. So like I say, data protection by design and by default is what we'll be talking about today when it comes to pre-production environments. But of course, what is the cost of non-compliance with some of these regulations? Well, it's right before you. Fines, prison sentences can easily be levied for breaching the controls in place to protect this information. There are so many pieces of legislation that can be enforced where personally identifiable information is concerned. Most notably in the United States, there is HIPAA, the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act, and SOX, Sarbanes-Oxley. So this is something that we at least have a history to pull from, that history of case law that lets us know whether what we are doing is acceptable. But of course, legislation is changing, so we need to keep up to date with it all. Just by looking down this list, you can see there are many cases that highlight just how much an impact each of these different pieces of legislation can have. So as we saw from rubric, and as we know from others, it is this pre-production exposure of production data that can form some of the greatest risk to our processes. Well, from the State of Database DevOps Report 2019, carried out by Redgate, we know that most people are already using a copy down of production into these environments. But we can all agree this should no longer be the case. There's no simple answer though to ensuring that our dev and test teams are easily enabled whilst ensuring that we're protecting all of our data. Or is there? Redgate's SQL provision will allow us to do just that. Effectively, we put in place a data firewall that allows us to copy down something that is like production. It still has the same look and the same feel but ultimately it's putting none of our data at risk. As an added bonus, it utilizes the virtual hard disk technology present in 64-bit windows to allow us to create virtualized copies. So not only do we remain compliant, but we can rapidly deliver very tiny imprint databases that can be dropped anywhere, like dev machines, test servers, anywhere. And the whole process can be very easily managed. So when there are fewer assets for us to worry about, even if there are vulnerabilities that can be exploited to gain access to the data in pre-production, because we've anonymized it, there exists a much smaller risk to our customers. And this is alongside the added benefits to us as a company that we can quickly spin up these cloned databases, that whether this is for dedicated sandbox development or more agile testing processes, being able to spin up 20 test environments, for instance. SQL provision enables compliant database DevOps at each stage of the pipeline and ultimately lets us move value up to production quickly. So let's actually see SQL provision in action. Now, as a developer or a DBA or anyone who's in charge of producing these environments, I want to be able to either very quickly and easily spin all of these up, or I want developers to be able to go in and self-serve. Take, for instance, my copy of the DM database. Now, in this copy, it's just a backup and a restore, and you can see here that I have a whole host of information. 
I have sensitive information like first names, last names, addresses, email addresses, all of these sorts of things that we want to protect when we go into pre-production. Now, fortunately, using SQL provision, I can just go ahead and say, hey, let's create a database clone. I'm going to go from my DM database image, and we're going to go ahead and drop a clone onto my Win 2016 development instance. I then give it a super realistic name like DM uh, database underscore, let's say it's a dev environment. I hit create clone. And in just a couple of seconds, I can actually give myself a fully masked copy of the database, which is taking up only about 50 megabytes of space, regardless of the size of the originating database, took seconds to create. And actually, when we open this up and take a look at our customer table, you'll notice that actually, there is a huge difference. Where before we had people such as Francesco Racciopo and Donalda Laudner, we now have Malk Kutzer and Amity Ziegler. And actually, in this anonymized data set, you'll notice that we actually have realistic addresses, realistic email addresses and phone numbers. So this is everything that a developer needs to come in, self-serve themselves, create themselves a clone, link it to source control, work on it, anything they need. But of course, it's not just self-serving that we want to be able to enable. Like I said, we want to be able to automate this whole process as well. Well, fortunately, we can absolutely do that as well. We can go ahead and automate it all using PowerShell, which will then kick off a number of processes. Perhaps this happens overnight, over the weekend, at the end of a sprint during part of a CI CD process. It will then take a copy of the database, ensure it's fully anonymized. And then once we have produced this fully anonymized image, that's then located, made available to our dev and test teams. And the moment that image is made available, we then spin up all of the clones we need for dev and test. So that could be, say, all of these for our forums environment. Now here we have, say, six or seven uh, DB clones being created simultaneously. And in just a few seconds, I can fully spin up all of the necessary environments that I need and ensure that they are fully anonymized. So there we are, we now have three testing environments uh, or three dev environments for Chris, for Tom and for David. We have a testing environment, a UAT environment, a QA environment, and we're able to do that all at the drop of a hat whilst ensuring that our data is protected. Now, how is Redgate SQL provision actually going ahead and doing this for us? How is it creating such cut down copies of the database? Is it, is it subsetting? Is it magic? No, fortunately, it's neither of these. We are getting full copies of the database, but we're utilizing very clever technology to ensure it is both protected and also saving us the time and space we may need as part of that provisioning process. Now, the first component of SQL provision that has gone ahead and protected the data for us is Data Masker. Now, Data Masker is a component that allows us to go ahead and build a what we call masking set, literally a set of rules that will anonymize the database in situ. It is static masking. Now, what this does is it allows us to build up a full list of different rules that will then help us protect the data. Now, before we actually go ahead and look at a couple of those rules that are enabling us to do this process, let's actually familiarize ourselves a bit with the component, with what it's doing. Now, fortunately, it gives us a good understanding of the environment that we're going to be protecting. It links to a copy, and that's what we're building a uh, masking set against. You can see that where we've anonymized our contacts table in the multiple copies we've just spun up, 
yes, we only have 10 source rows in that particular table. But of course, remember that principle I was speaking about earlier. It was data protection by design and by default. Now, whether we have 10 source rows to protect or 10 million or 10 billion rows to protect, we need to ensure that they are all being masked. Now, we can actively build ourselves a to-do list up against this and actually say, well, contacts ID, for instance, that's only a numeric value. We're not worried about it. So we'll say no mask. Contact full name. Yes, absolutely. That's sensitive data. We're going to go ahead and mask that. And this allows us to then build up that effectively implementation list of columns that need to be protected when we go ahead and mask them. Now, once we're building our to-do list, of course, there are a few other things that we need to bear in mind. Now, Data Masker itself is multi-threaded, i.e. it allows for the concurrent masking of multiple tables within a database at the same time. Now, I can hear you thinking, but Chris, doesn't that then open up the opportunity for us to cause a deadlock against the target database that's being masked? And the answer to that question is yes. But fortunately, within Data Masker, there's some very easy ways of getting around that particular problem and ensuring that the masking process is not only performant, but also safe in terms of not causing those deadlocks. Now, those do not relate specifically to the number of cores on the machine. That is, of course, just the number of worker threads or connections that can be spawned by the tool at any one time. Now, everything that Data Masker does is underpinned by a few key concepts. And the most important of these is the data set. Now, a data set is just that, is a set of information effectively that allows us to take realistic, useful values and then put them into our copy of the database. We have things like bank account numbers in the Netherlands or country names, counties, a whole host of credit card numbers. Effectively, any data set that you need is probably already going to be there as we provide just over 100 preset data sets for you to use. Now, we do understand there will be times where we don't uh, offer a data set that is particularly required for your masking needs. So where you're building out your masking set, it's also very, very easy to then create your own user-defined data set as well. If we take a look at this particular data set here, uh, this is my SLDs set or second level domains. Now, I'm sure that most of the people listening here today, uh, some of you, if not most of you, have at some point in time received an email from a company where they've accidentally uh, tested some kind of email system and you've ended up with a test email they've later apologized for. And we don't want to be the company that sends that apology to our customers. What we would like is to know that the email addresses in uh, pre-production look like real email addresses, but ultimately aren't and will never let an email go to a living individual. Now, by using my user-defined data set here, I'm able to generate a number of fake or reserved second-level domains such as .test, .example.com, uh, .localhost, and that just means it will look like a real email address. Now, there is one other type of data set I do want to mention just whilst we're here, and that is something we call a correlated data set. Now, a correlated data set is just that, is a set that can be used to correlate masked values across multiple columns within a table. And you can see here that where we're looking at our zip codes, plus state, plus county, plus town set uh, within the United States, you can see we've got some realistic uh, locations such as Sarasota, Florida, with a Sarasota zip code. And this just means that the data we're putting into our masked copy of the database for when we consume it will retain that usability and will look just like production, but again, 
will not be true sensitive information. Now, what I have in this particular masking set is two different rules. Now, if I open up new rule, you can see that we have a whole host of different options available for you to help you in protecting that copy of the database. Now, they generally fall into three major buckets. The first of those is a masking rule, i.e. let's update the value in the database so that it is irreversibly masked. The next bucket is the synchronization rules. That means once we've masked the data, how do we then do other things with it? How do we persist a newly masked first name and last name into an email column? But then we also may need to synchronize internally to the table itself or even to other tables. The complexities of masking a database don't just stop with, can I replace Chris with Tom? But actually mean that we then need to fix denormalization. We need to maintain the referential integrity of the multiple tables that we have. So to do that, we would use a, a synchronization rule. Now, the third bucket of those is the special function, utility, or refresh rules. These are things that we would typically use for very specific cases, such as if you have a non-clustered index that's over several columns uh, that you're trying to mask, and that non-clustered index is fighting with what is effectively an update statement from Data Masker. That will then slow the masking process down considerably. So what you can do is temporarily disable an index, then run the masking over it, and then re-enable it as well. So very much special function and utility. Not super often are they used, but they're definitely there to enable your masking process. Now, as you'll see in my set here, I have a substitution rule. And that just means a rule that will substitute the values in the table with new values, new masked values from those data sets. In this case, I'm masking the contact full name with full names, so male and female first and last names. We're creating masked anonymized uh, phone numbers. We then have anonymized addresses as well, including that correlated data set there as well. So they'll have realistic US-based addresses too. Now, what we then have is a row internal synchronization rule. Now, what this is doing is effectively taking out the substring of our full name column. It's taking the first name and the last name that have been newly masked, and then it's concatenating them together, utilizing two more of Data Masker's data sets, in this case, text random dictionary words, and our second level domains user-defined data set as well. And it's concatenating those all together, such that we'll end up potentially anonymizing Chris Unwin to be Tom Austin, and then Tom.Austin at a random email address like at happiness.localhost or at window.example.com. Now you'll see that there's an ever so slight difference in how this is laid out. The rules do not appear next to each other in Data Masker, and that references back to what I told you about the concurrency within the tool. Now, because these rules are both looking at the same table, i.e. the contacts table, they could indeed cause a deadlock. Now to avoid that, I have created what we call a rule dependency, such that the rules have been serialized. So that means the row internal rule will only kick off once the substitution rule has completed. Now the way we create these is very simple. I just click on the rule I want to make dependent and drag it to the rule I want to make it dependent on. All I have to do is then drop it and you'll see it then indents the rule. Now this set that we are looking at right here is actually the one I used with that automated process of spinning up all of those clones. And in fact, if we jump back into Management Studio and take a look at that, 
you'll see the difference. I have my old forums-redgate-com dev environment. It was a shared environment. It was very difficult for us to work with. People were treading on each other's toes with their changes. And actually, we weren't able to refresh it all that often. The compounding fact on top of that is, of course, that we had sensitive information in there as well. Things like, oh, I don't know, the current president of PASS, Grant Fritchie, there he is. And we need to ensure that Grant is protected when we're creating these copies. Now, as we've just seen, that set we built in Data Masker to protect the copy of the forums database means that I can come into any one of these clones we created automatically. And again, like we saw with our self-serve clone, we now have masked information. In fact, Grant has become Hafiz Rosenblum. I'm sure he'll be glad to know that. Now, how have we then distributed that copy though? We've been able to mask it, that's very straightforward. And we don't have to mask it multiple times. How are we then taking copies of this masked information and dishing it out either automatically or allowing people to self-serve new development and testing environments? Well, that's the other half of SQL provision. Now, effectively, what we provide is a cloning technology. Now, this cloning technology relies on two key concepts. So the first concept is what we call an image. Now, an image is a virtual hard disk. Like I said, it's leveraging Windows technologies. Now, this virtual hard disk is spun up on a Windows file share, and then we create a copy of the database, either from a database backup, that's a, a .bac file uh, native backup, or a .sqb Redgate SQL backup, backup file, and those underlying files, the MDF, the LDF, those are copied across into this virtual hard disk on the Windows file share. Once this file copy has completed, you've paid your one-off clone tax that happens automatically anyway, but it's copied those across and then we run the static masking down it. That then protects all of our sensitive data. And once that has happened, we then effectively put the lid onto the virtual hard disk, it finalizes, and we have this immutable image. Now from there, we spin up those clones. And the clones themselves are localized differencing disks that effectively sit on top of the image we've just created. And wherever we drop them to any instance of SQL Server, whether that be a dev machine, a test server, anywhere, SQL Server, Windows, they all see this as a full copy of the database, when actually it's not. But we're given all of the information because we have virtualized and centralized the main storage, the bulk of the schema and the data exist in that image that's on the file share, but the clone just acts as a, a dummy for us to work on. We can still make changes, we can add stored procedures, we can link our clones to source control should we wish. And that is what then allows us to carry on our development process and not have to slow down. Now, because these localized differencing disks don't contain any of the source data or schema, they're actually very, very small, typically only about 50 megabytes. That would mean if I were to take, for instance, the Stack Overflow December 2016 database, which was 91.1 gigabytes, I could very quickly, easily spin up a clone of this. And we can call it something creative like SO dev clone. And in just a couple of seconds, we then have our full copy of the database effectively. But even though it was 91.1 gigabytes to begin with, the SO clone will, of course, be 50 megabytes. Even though it's 50 meg megabytes, obviously, we also have access to all of that rich information. So like I say, we're enabling dev and test to have everything they need to ensure the changes they make are then going to affect production in the correct way. But we don't have to worry about those space 
time and indeed when we include masking as part of that imaging process we don't have to include uh, the sensitive data either now of course we don't mask the clones that would create a lot of differences and cause the clones to grow the actual masking itself is carried out at image point now we can create as i said the image from a live sql server connection or from a backup and as we're creating the image, that's when we specify that masking set we just saw. But we can also include any SQL scripts we may wish to include as well. Now, this means that if, for instance, on our production database, we have production level permissions and users we need to swap out in order to prepare it for consumption in pre-production, then we can actually specify SQL scripts at this point to make the necessary changes so that they have the dev and test permissions and users we may require. Effectively, everything is carried out on the image to make sure it is absolutely perfect for dev and test that we're not putting any sensitive information at risk. Now, you saw me actually automate the entire process there. Now, Fortunately, as part of SQL provision, we do provide a number of pre-packaged PowerShell commandlets for you to use. So effectively, you can put in place a full provisioning process that, as I said, happens automatically at the, say, overnight, at the end of the week, at the end of a sprint, or as part of a continuous integration and deployment process as well. Now, of course, the PowerShell can be built into any CI, CD tools that you may wish to use it on to spin up those testing environments or a staging environment to deploy to. But if you're lucky enough to be using something like TFS or Azure DevOps, then there is already a plugin available in the marketplace for you to do this. Now, all I did, and there's no error handling built in here, it's just very simple PowerShell. All I did was specify I wanted to create a new SQL clone image. I gave it the location of my backup file. I told it to use my masking script. And then that is what then went and spun up all of those environments for me. This means that refreshing those environments actually doesn't need to be a painful process. Now, the good thing about uh, provision, obviously, besides the fact it can be automated, as you saw, is that people can come in and self-serve. Gone are the days where we have to wait for someone to spin us up a replacement copy of the database. We can actually integrate SQL provision with Active Directory, actually enable these permissions and allow our developers to come in and self-serve themselves clones from our anonymized images. That way, it becomes a mixture of uh, collaboration, communication, but also not having to slow down at any stage, whether it's waiting for an environment refresh or waiting for a new environment as well. Besides the fact it's not just sacking up uh, all of your time if you're the person who's responsible for this process. So then, if you're interested in how Redgate SQL provision can actually help you actually be implemented to help you tackle some of those problems you're facing with your development and testing processes, then you may wish to read the uh, case study from Redgate. Who We effectively worked with Key Pro to help them ensure HIPAA compliance using SQL provision in their pre-production environments. Now, they were struggling from two sides. The first, of course, was we have a lot of information. How do we easily give this out to developers, to testers, to anyone who needs a copy to ensure that they are able to do the best work of their lives? The other side of things was, well, we can't actually enable that process because we have a lot of sensitive information as well. So we can't justify the giving of sensitive information to our developers and testers. It's non-consented processing. So what we need is something realistic. We need to be able to deliver these copies potentially to offshore development teams. And we want to save ourselves the amount of time we're currently putting in with this masking and provisioning or refresh process. 
And Keepo were able to not only reclaim terabytes of disk space, but we were also able to help them be compliant with their HIPAA regulations. So a quick benefit, what does SQL provision actually enable us to do? Well, first off, it allows us to virtualize the storage for those development and testing databases. By creating that single centralized image on the file share, we're able to completely virtualize the underlying files, give everyone these dummy clone copies they can work on, they can deliver value on, but ultimately we're not moving around bulks of information. So we're able to save space if we're moving a 10 terabyte database, for instance, around we don't need 10 terabytes on a developer laptop, on a test server, et cetera. We're able to protect, so we're able to actually update the sensitive information in our copy of production such that if anyone is able to get their hands on that copy of production, it is useless to them because all of the data has been anonymized. The good thing about Data Masker as well is that it is fully extensible, customizable to your requirements, whether it's creating user-defined data sets or handling very specific requirements. There are a whole host of rules that allow you to get it just so that it will perfectly represent your data sets in production. As I say, the whole thing can be automated as well using that native PowerShell uh, commandlets that come prepackaged up with SQL provision, actually being able to build it into any automation processes that you currently have. And you're able to manage the whole thing as well. With one glance at the dashboard, you know exactly where all of your copies are. We're no longer creating a backup and then restoring it into multiple different environments and potentially forgetting about some of these. It's all about tighter controls, easier auditability, but not trading those off against developer requirements. So then a quick Q&A session uh, to have a look at some of the questions that you guys have been posting. So we've got one question, if I mask a field, name, email, et cetera, can I set up Data Masker to always mask it in the same repeatable way? For example, in testing scenarios, it can be useful for data to be consistent in this way. So there's a couple of different answers to this. I think you're touching on deterministic masking. Um, what I will say is that, of course, when you mask an image, all of the clones, because they're all pointing at the same image, will all receive the same information. So if you spin up, say, 10 clones from our masked image, all of those go into testing. They will all have the same anonymized information. There are ways of implementing deterministic masking with Data Masker over periods of time. It does require kind of adapting the process. And if you're able to get in touch with us, then we'll be, able, we'll be more than happy to kind of go over that uh, more in depth. Uh, another one was, do the masked databases uh, instances need to exist on a single SQL server? In our environment, we have separate servers hosting dev, test, UAT, and prod. No, absolutely, they don't need to exist on just one SQL server. You can drop these clones wherever you need them. So effectively, they go onto a dev server, a test server, a UAT server, etc. As long as they all have that um, access, that ability to uh, pull back from the image on the Windows file share, then absolutely they can be dropped wherever you need them. So another question, is there any information available for us to get started with using SQL provision? So yes, absolutely. Not only are there a couple of uh, ways for you to get in touch with us. So, for instance, uh, speaking to us at SQL provision at red gate.com or going to red gate.com forward slash SQL provision. But there is also uh, Redgate University. Now, Redgate University is a string of uh, videos on how to use the tools um, filmed by myself. So, if you haven't got enough of listening to me, 
then absolutely you can go along and have a listen to uh, some of these videos which will show you in depth how to tackle each rule in Data Masker, how to implement this technology, how to make real use out of it. And that can be found going to the Redgate Hub. Now, very, very straightforward to get there. All we need to do is type in SQL provision, Redgate University, and there we are. Now, this will take you through everything you need to know about SQL provision, and you can learn everything there. Now, there is one other thing I wanted to mention just before we kind of end the session naturally, if no one else has any additional questions, is that Redgate are also holding a number of events. Now, if you're interested in coming along and actually talking to us, then feel free to come to red-gate.com forward slash hub forward slash events, where you can register to come and see us at one of our events uh, SQL in the City Summit, which will be held in Austin and LA and London, all of these wonderful places. And if you register using the code webinar, then you will be able to attend for free. And we're not in the business of giving everything away for free, but if you want to do some fantastic learning, then please do go along. Like I said, the code is webinar for registrants. If you're unable to make it, please don't worry. There will also be SQL in the City, our live streamed event on April 3rd, which again will give you more wonderful information about not just SQL provision, but compliant database DevOps as a whole. For now though, if no one else has any other questions, thank you very much for your time. Have a great rest of the week and hopefully we'll see you again soon.